Oh, my aching back. I think most of us have said and felt that at least once, if not many times. So today, a discussion of back problems, next on Health Talk. Hello, I'm Jay Noreen, and welcome to Health Talk. Most of us have experienced back pain from time to time. It's annoying, it's painful, sometimes it's debilitating. Our guest this week knows as much about backs as anybody and how to treat them. So please meet Dr. Jim Califf from Ortho Carolina here in Boone. Jim, welcome to Health Talk. We're glad to have you here. Thank you, glad to be here. All right. Well, let's talk kind of from the beginning. How common is back pain? Back pain is very common. It's one of the most common reasons uh, people see their primary care providers. Um, most people have back pain at some point in their lives. Usually it's short-lived, but it can be recurrent, but it almost always gets better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say it almost always gets better, what just naturally or with treatment or what, what, what typically happens to the average run-of-the-mill back pain? The average run-of-the-mill back pain gets better with just minimal treatment, usually a little rest, a little over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medication. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of people do not see their physician with that typical episode of just mild back pain. Mm -hmm. It's when it becomes more severe or more long, uh, long-standing that they choose to see a physician mm -hmm. for their care. So a lot of people just kind of grin and bear it for long enough that it starts to go away. Yes. What, what if you're, if you're, you have a, a friends that uh, haven't seen you as a physician, but you know, they, at the, at the dinner you're at or at the curbstone, they're, they're gonna ask you some questions. What is it that you would advise somebody who's having back pain to decide, okay, I really do need to be seen? What, what, what are the things that would be indicators for, I guess I really need to be seen by my physician? Well, the, the main indicators are, one is if it's a recurrent problem, mm -hmm. but the main thing that we look for, make sure there's no underlying severe cause of the back pain, such as a cancer or a herniated disc, which would lead to weakness. So basically, if they've had feverish chills, if they've had weight loss, if they have radiating pain down their arm or their leg and they have weakness that has persisted, any trouble with their bowels or their bladder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say radiating pain, for you know, as physicians, we, we use those terms oftentimes and don't realize people might not know exactly what that is. For the uninitiated, describe a little bit what that's really like. Well, it's, people describe it as a sciatica. That's a term most people call it by, but basically it's a shooting or burning pain that radiates typically all the way down the leg, at least past the knee, usually down into the foot and ankle. Mm -hmm. It can vary depending on what position you get in. It can be different with different people. Um, but typically it's a sharp shooting pain which radiates down the leg past the knee. You know, one of the things that, uh, that my wife and I talk about, she says she has a very high tolerance for pain. And I don't know if that's really true, but have you found in patients that there's quite a variation in how tolerant people are with uh, radiating pain or any kind of back pain? Oh yes, that's very true. With, okay. But with back pain in particular, everybody has some back pain at some point in their lives and most people don't see a physician. And you can see two people almost side by side, same age, same underlying issues that have back pain and their pain level is oh. completely different. That's interesting. Well, I think you just came down on her side of my thinking she didn't have such a high tolerance. Maybe she, in fact, does. I think she does, actually, yeah. just to put it more seriously. When you look at uh, causes, how do you list your kind of differential, your list of, uh, of, of causes for back pain? What, why do you make that list? Well, we kind of like to try to get an idea if we can figure out what, what actually caused that particular person to have back pain. Honestly, if you were to take a patient or two, put them in front of an audience of 100 spine specialists from the, throughout the country and presented their history without any major trauma, there would be an argument as to what really caused their pain. Okay. The majority of time, for just simple back pain, we really don't know. Uh -huh. pa patients don't like hearing that, but yeah. the bottom line is you really don't know, but it almost always gets better within six weeks. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. One of the things that uh, in, in my experience when I was practicing, I, I would see people who had back pain because, because I worked in industry somewhat, from lifting. 
How common is it that it's you do a bad lift or a lift that's not carefully done? That is common in people that do, either the people that do lifting all the time for their job and they simply sort of wear out or lift a different way, or the people that, particularly up here, they don't do anything all winter, spring comes, they're outside working in their garden and they're not used to bending and lifting. Mm -hmm. That can be a common cause and that's usually an injury to the muscles, mm -hmm. although it can lead to a, a disc herniation. Okay, but more commonly muscle or ligament yes. rather than an actual herniation. Right. When, you know, we, I think everybody's heard the term uh, herniated disc. Can you describe it from the layman's terms and what really is a herniated disc? Okay. The disc is kind of like a jelly donut. We describe a lot of things in medicine in ter on terms of food. Mm -hmm. And the disc mm -hmm. is like a jelly donut. It has a thick outer part and a softer inside. And the inside is kind of a composition between crab meat and toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And so the outer part of the disc is very thick. and very tough and if it can get a weak spot it can tear it can actually extrude some disc material out either a bulging disc or herniated disc or ruptured disc they're all kind of degrees of the same problem okay and then that disc material can actually push out and push on the spinal cord or on a nerve so typically what happens is you have an injury the back hurts to start with that's when the thick outer part of the disc begins to tear and then the um getting a call yeah on call. <laughs> um, and then the disc actually ruptures and frequently the back pain will get better and the pain going down the leg will, will come on. And that's when the disc material is pushing on the nerve. Okay. So the, the rupture actually changes the symptoms. Yes. When the rupture actually occurs. Yes. And now when you're seeing a patient who has got uh, manifestations of, of herniation uh, or emerging rupture or rupture, can you diagnostically without going to x-rays and MRIs and so on, can, can you get a pretty good sense just from your evaluation and your experience of yes, where they're you at? can, because typically if a disc ruptures and pushing it on a nerve, it's going to cause pain radiating into a certain part of the leg or the arm if it's in the neck. Mm -hmm. The different nerves go to different parts of the arm or the leg, and so you can usually tell where the symptoms are and where the numbness is and where the, the muscular weakness is, which nerve is being pushed upon by the okay. disc okay. material. Okay. Now we've been talking all about back, but but I know you do a lot of neck surgery too. Yes. Uh, what? T tell us a little bit about what are the problems that are cervical, the neck uh, problems that are different from what we think of as back problems. Yeah, in the neck there aren't as many muscles in the neck, so the back, the the, the neck issues tend to be more of an aching neck. They tend to be more from arthritis than from just muscles, unless you're in an accident like a whiplash type injury. Mm -hmm. That's usually mainly muscular, but mm -hmm. neck issues tend to be mainly neck pain, and then when a disc herniates in the neck, usually you have severe arm pain, usually not a whole lot of neck pain with that. As opposed to the back, most of the time is accompanied by back pain followed by the herniated disc and the leg pain. Although sometimes patients come in with absolutely no pain in their back and the herniated disc. Huh, interesting. Well, you know, uh, President George H.W. Bush had a serious neck injury. Yes. And uh, you've probably been watching that fairly carefully. Uh, but uh, what I heard was that he's probably going to be about three months before he's fully recovered. That, that sounds like a pretty serious injury. Yes, our, it, our, it is. And I believe the kind of injury head is one that we typically treat without surgery. So sometimes those actually take longer to heal because sometimes certain neck injuries, if we operate on fractures in the neck, uh -huh. this, we put hardware to stabilize. Same thing as in the back. And so people can be more active quicker, whereas if there's no hardware there to support it, it just takes a little bit longer. We have to be careful a little bit longer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But our neck injuries or neck neck manifestations, do they tend to be even more worrisome and serious than back, or are they pretty much in the same ballpark? There can be more worrisome simply because if you have a major neck problem, it affects. It can affect not just your neck and your arms, but your whole body, whereas yeah. the back will affect from your back down your legs. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, one of the things that I know uh, people in healthcare. care uh, uh, in the industry uh, are concerned about is using our technology most efficiently, I guess is a way to put it. We have a lot of high-tech equipment, you know, MRI, CAT scans. How, how, what's your thinking about when you want to order a, a CAT scan or an MRI or even an X-ray for somebody with back pain? How do you make that call? And I know it's a, it's a concern. Yeah, usually we start off um, with an exam in the office and we take a history and if, if there's been no major trauma and they don't have any of the warning signs like fever, steals, weight loss we talked about earlier, any history of cancer and they're having mainly just back pain, we don't usually even need to jump into an x-ray if it's been okay. less than six to eight weeks. 
simply because x-rays show arthritis early on and most people's x-rays aren't, aren't going to be normal. So the first decision we make, let's order an x-ray if we need to. Mm -hmm. And then based on the x-ray findings and how they've responded to treatment, we'll determine whether we order another scan, a CAT scan or an um, MRI. You know, I'm sure that most people out there have heard the words CAT scan and MRI, but probably don't know much more than the words CAT scan or MRI. Okay. Can you can you kind sure. of inform the public a little about yeah, the, that? Yeah, the, the CAT scan's been around for a, a long time, and it basically is a series of x-rays taken through the bone. It involves radiation. It involves a lot of radiation. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to show bones better than it shows discs in the spinal cord and the nerves. Uh, uh, um, MRI is much better at showing the actual inside of the spine, the bones, I mean the, the nerves and the disc, whether they're protruding or not. It has no radiation involved with it. It is more expensive. Mm -hmm. But typically if we're looking, very rarely do we order a CAT scan on uh, the back of the neck now unless we're looking for something unusual because the MRI simply usually shows us so much more of what we want to see. Yeah, yeah. You know one of the things that, uh, that I've, I've observed is that the average patient kind of wants to get all these special diagnostic tests, uh, and so you, you probably sometimes have to convince people it's not necessary yet. Is that true? Oh, that's very true. Um, particularly, my indications for ordering a, a scanner is number one, if they have w warning signs, or number two is if they are a candidate for some other type of a treatment, either surgery, epidural cortisone injections. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, over the age of 25, nobody has a totally normal MRI. Uh -huh. Many people have herniated disc on MRIs that they don't have any symptoms. So if you order an MRI and you get some findings, it may not have anything to do with what the patient's complaining about. Yeah. So we try not, and particularly in this day and age of number one, trying to manage costs. And it's interesting, now that more of the cost is being shifted to the patient, it used to be that MRIs were almost free. Yeah. Now with their health insurance plans with a $5,000 deductible, you tell the patient this is going to cost you $700, yeah. they may, now they're more likely to say, well, let's wait and see. Yeah. And when you say they used to be free, they, were, they weren't free, they were just free to the patient free from the, patient the patient's perception. Exactly, because yeah. yeah. it was all covered by the insurance company. Yeah, right. And I think we've been moving more to patients being aware of, of, of these kind of things than we yes. probably did in the past. Uh, the uh, timing for moving to the next stage is, is kind of an interesting thing I wonder if you could speak to. So you're seeing a patient and probably referred from one of your primary care colleagues. Uh, what's the kind of one, two, three, four, five series of treatment modalities that you, that you yeah, I know you, t you start first with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, you know, ibuprofen, that sort of thing. Yeah. But what's the kind of stepwise, again from the patient's perspective, what treatment I, am I going to get and where do I go down the line before I really need to get to the big time treatment surgery? Yeah, well typically we begin treatment with either uh, the over-the-counter medication, anti-inflammatory, Tylenol, uh, muscle relaxants if they've had an injury, an exercise program, follow them for a while. If they're improving, then we tend to keep following them. However, if they continue to have discomfort, if they develop weakness, radiating pain, they can't stand, they're requiring narcotics, then we go ahead and order an MRI. Mm -hmm. Based on the MRI, there may be several options, including one is waiting a little bit longer, the other is continuing therapy, or sending them for an a, a, a epidural steroid injection, mm -hmm. which too, it can sometimes decrease a hot, the inflammation from a hot disc sure. to help with the pain. And, Avoid surgery. Ninety percent of ruptured discs never need surgery. They Ninety percent. Yeah, they get That's an impressive own. number. I would guess the average person in the street would would not guess that uh, right. that uh, it's that uncommon to need yeah. surgery. And you know, surgery in this country is a whole lot more frequent than surgery in in, in other countries. Um, yeah, now, why is that? I, I've read that well, too. I think it's because number one, people in this country aren't patient. They like to get things fixed. Yeah. Um, number two is it is becoming more and more of a problem. You have a lot now of surgeons that do only spine surgery. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of patients that have back pain and don't have an answer. You have insurance companies that pay surgeons very well to do spine surgery. You put all that together and it's not a particularly good picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got people looking for an answer. You've got surgeons wanting to make a living. And sure. It just, I think it just leads to more surgery. For a herniated disc, the studies have pretty much shown that one to two years after the initial injury, those that had surgery and didn't have surgery are doing about the same. Oh, kind of really? what surgery does is it gets the patients better quicker, lets you get back to work quicker, lets uh -huh. you enjoy your lifestyle quicker. Yeah. 
in other countries where there's not as much access to surgery, you know, people can just afford not to have surgery, can kind of wait it out. It's well, a different mindset. Yeah. So one to two years out, not a big difference between the surgical uh, intervention and more conservative treatment. That's for, right. Just for herniated discs. We're not talking about disc. other things, but right. herniated discs. Yeah. What, would, would you uh, describe what really happens when you're, when you're doing a herniated disc surgery, A, and then B, what's the typical patient experience over the course of the next several months after, after surgery? Okay, for the typical herniated disc, we make a little small incision, it can be half an inch long. We go in, we dissect through the muscle, using that incredibly muscle, we just separate the muscle, get right down where we need to do the surgery, take out a minimal amount of bone, and then just remove the portion of the disc material that's pushing on the nerve or on the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, leave the rest of the disc there. We don't take out all the disc material because the only way to do that is to clean out the whole disc and, and do a fusion. Typically, they wake up and the leg pain's gone mm -hmm. on the average patient. Mm -hmm. The weakness may take a while longer to go away, and the numbness may never go away, although it, it usually does. That's the last to, to go away. So they kind of take it easy around the house for a couple of weeks. We don't like them to dry for a couple of weeks, but they're up and walking right away. Mm -hmm. Most of the disc surgery now is done as an outpatient. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have it done and go home the same day. Okay. The tricky part this day and age with the smaller incisions, the microsurgery, um, they don't have much back pain after surgery. Mm -hmm. So they want to get up and get active right away. In the, in the past years, with bigger incisions, they hurt a lot, so they didn't want to get up and do much. So mm -hmm. you can, we need to let that defect in the disc heal before they get up and do too much to try to keep more disc material from rupturing out. So you have to tell them to slow down a yeah. little bit rather. And you know, I think, at least in my experience earlier in my career, when you, patients with back problems and had surgery, uh, you had to convince them to get active. Now it's sort of the reverse. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, talking about exercise for somebody who is not at the surgical level now, what are the kind of exercises that a typical, you know, mild to moderate back pain, what kind of exercise do they, the patients actually get well, recommended? The, yeah, the first thing we start with is just getting up and moving around. We used to say go to bed for two weeks. That's bad. And then yeah. we say a day or two of bed <laughs> rest at the most and get up and walk. We begin with just walking and then we generally start on some good core strengthening exercises. Mm -hmm. And then as the pain decreases, we begin working on some range of motion exercises for the back. Mm -hmm. We can kind of vary depending on exactly what their condition is. Some people do better with flexion exercises, bending only forward. Some people do better with um, bending backward for exercises. There's mm -hmm. no one set that helps uh -huh. everybody. Uh -huh. Now what about uh, from a preventive point of view, either not to get the back pain in the first place, but once you get it and you're healed up and you're feeling better, uh, what kind of preventive exercises are good for people? Well the best one is just be active. The second best one is work hard on your core exercises. Okay. Tai Chi, yoga, just some good core strengthening exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's the best um, thing you can do for you back in the long run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, uh, yeah we've talked with, uh, with some of your colleagues about osteoporosis and the importance of uh, impact exercise. Is that relevant for yeah. backs as well? Yes, it is, okay. very, very much so, because actually one of the more common problems in elderly with backs is to have a fracture from osteoporosis. Uh -huh. And the more active people can be, the better they can do their calcium and vitamin D intake when they're younger, the less likely they are to have a compression fracture. Is there uh, an age relatedness to back pain? Uh, is it much more common in, in older age, or uh, do you see quite a few young people with back problems? We see quite a few young people with back problems. It probably peaks around the age of 40. The younger patients tend to get more muscle strains and her disc herniations. The older people tend to get more pain from arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, the reason younger people get more disc herniations is the older you get, the discs begin to dry out and they're less likely to herniate. Okay, yeah. Now you talked about the, the treatment by injection, that uh, steroidal injection that's used and, and is quite effective. When is that indicated? How often is that a treatment that that's, you don't have to go to surgery, you do that and that takes care of it? Yeah, that is used in a fair number of patients if they continue to have pain radiating from their herniated disc and they mm -hmm. haven't responded to the anti-inflammatories in time, typically we'll try, an, we'll try the injection and it can be done in a series of three injections. And that kind of helps get people through the six to eight week period when the majority of ruptured discs get better. It's okay. just an acute way to decrease the inflammation. So they, when you say three, a series of three over six weeks? Yeah, well, they could, it's a series of three injections, which they can do a week to two weeks apart. Okay. 
Now, is that something that, that people could do for a longer term as well, or you just use it as a sort of a gap, a gap treatment? Just kind of use it as sort of a, a gap treatment. You can, the typical recommendation is at most two series of three injections a year. Okay, okay. Uh, what about laser surgery? I mean, that's, uh, that's something that's uh, been used in a lot of ways, but how, how does it fit for orthopedics? Yeah, laser surgery is all over the TV, as everybody's saying. Yeah, exactly. Um, it is indicated to very few people, and actually none of the major medical centers do laser surgery. There are no control studies on laser surgery, okay. so it mainly as a marketing tool. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Simply because what it does is all soft tissue work, and you can do very little with most back problems with the laser. And now there's other kinds of surgery that, uh, that are quite innovative now, the, the, the injection of material that, that uh, uh, replaces part of, 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 uh, of, the, of the body parts in the back. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. It's relatively new. As it's relatively new. It's been present now probably for five to ten years, but compression fractures in the elderly were, are a severe problem. They're common. They can be very, very painful. Mm -hmm. And it used to be there was nothing you could do but give it time, treat patients with narcotics. They're elderly. They don't do well with narcotics. Whereas this kyphoplasty on the right type of compression fracture is a minimally invasive procedure, a little catheter that goes in, put in bone cement, and usually the pain from the fracture goes away right away. It's a great treatment. So it really sort of is a replacement for the bone that's been, uh, that's been lost. Yeah, it's basically a, a cast on the inside of the body that yeah. just uh, keeps the fracture from moving and uh -huh. the pain goes away. But particularly for elderly people, you, because they have compression fractures, and you see elderly people who have shrunk because right. they've got compression because fractures, basically. Yeah. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, significant interventions is spinal fusion. Can you talk a little bit about what that procedure is? Yeah, um, the fusion of the spine is done for s certain indications. I think it's frequently overdone, but basically what we're doing, if you get in a condition where the spine either isn't stable or the arthritis is so bad mm -hmm. that you need to stabilize the spine, typically what it involves is cleaning out of this space, jacking that disc space up to its height that was to begin with, because usually it's um, narrowed down putting bone graft in the disc space and then putting posterior instrumentation, screws and rods to hold it in place while it mm -hmm. heals mm -hmm. and using bone graft. Well, it is, it, I mean, obviously it's much more extensive than, uh, than the treatment for a herniated disc that's surgical. What, what's, the, what's the expected prognosis for somebody who's got uh, that kind of pretty significant intervention? It can be pretty good if it's done for the right indications. Mm -hmm. If somebody has one or two level disease and the rest of their back looks pretty good, it can really make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Very rarely does it get rid of all the back pain, simply okay. because there are other issues in the back. That you, typically, if you've got a disc that's to the point where it needs fusion, there are some issues going on with other levels that are going to give you some pain. But uh -huh. Typically, it can help a lot if it's done for the right indications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be interested to, to, to hear how your career got you to where you are. How did you get interested in orthopedic surgery, and, uh, and you know, how, does, how does that well, work? When I was growing up, one of my best friends in my Boy Scout troops, dad was an orthopedic surgeon. Uh -huh. And I've always liked fixing things, and I got really interested in orthopedics. I w went to medical school, did my residency, probably halfway through medical school, decided I wanted to do orthopedics. Um, while I was doing my residency, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in orthopedics. My dad always has had back problems. He uh -huh. always could say, nobody can figure out what's wrong with my back, so it kind of sparked an interest in backs. Mm -hmm. So I spent some extra time during my training doing some back um, things in my s surgery residency and went into practice doing general orthopedics and, and spine work. And, over the years, my spine work's probably been about 35 to 40 percent of my of okay. my practice. So I like it because I don't have to find spine problems to fix. Yeah, yeah. I can do other things in orthopedics, sure. and, which I enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think the average person uh, who has a physician that they're close to and don't really get a chance to ask that kind of question. Yeah. You know, how did you get in? Why did you go to? Med what happened? What got? What got you there? So, uh, walk us a little bit through your your training. What what happened? from you got your MD degree, then what happened? I, mean, I know this, but a lot of people don't know yeah, what okay. that training is all well, about. Yeah, so we, we finished college, you, you go to four years of, 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 of medical school, and then in medical school, you decide, get an idea of what you want to do when you finish. So if you go into orthopedics, you do general surgery for one or two years, at Duke there was two years, and then you do four years of orthopedics. Mm -hmm. Then you're an orthopedic surgeon. Some people go on and do an extra one or two years, and so, total joints or uh, a 
spine surgery or something like that, and then you typically go into practice. Um, at this day and age, more and more people are going into only sports medicine, only total joints. Mm -hmm. So the general orthopedists, even though we need more and more of them, they're becoming less and less frequent because people want to do only shoulders or only knees. Or, so it really is affecting particularly areas like bone where you don't have enough patients to maintain a guy that wants to do only shoulders. Sure. So the trick is to be able to get a person at those general orthopedics. The group I'm in, North Carolina, has done a really good job of getting guys that are interested in general orthopedics, but they subspecialize. And mm -hmm. that really has helped this community. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're a relative newcomer to the community, as I understand. Yes, I've been here since May of 2013. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great community. It really is. It's a great place to practice medicine, yeah. too. Well, Jim, thank you very much. This has been very informative. Uh, I know there are a lot of people out there who are interested in back pain because they experience yeah, it right. probably more often than they'd like to yeah. remember. But uh, we really appreciate your, your taking part. It's great information for the public, and we're glad you're here, and we're glad you moved to Boone. Great. Thank you so much for Good having me. Good to see you. Thanks right. very much. That's Health Talk for this week. If you have questions or comments for us, you can reach us through our website. That's watchapptv.com. Until next time, I'm Jay Noreen.